just kind of keep sharing you a little bit more about me. Um, one of my pet peeves, as you're sharing yours, is my pet peeves are when people like, kind of what you're talking about, they look at someone and make an assumption, but like it might be in a Bible study you might be having, and they make the assumption that the interpretation and meaning is left up to them. And we'll talk more about this in the semester, but one of the things I always kind of get frustrated when people will say, well, this means to me. And I'm like, um, yeah, you didn't write this. So, you know, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. That's why I'm so passionate about this class, because I want us to discover, okay, what did this mean to the original author, God, not to myself, you know? And we'll talk more about that down the road when we get to application, because application is then your determination, how you're going to apply this to your life in a unique way. But the reality is, is that our job is really to do more of the investigation, more to understand, not just to say, well, this means to me, and then come up with whatever kind of interpretation you want. It kind of is like um, when we've been looking at, um, as you're really trying to investigate something that took place, or you're not quite sure, let's say you were a detective of a crime, and you're, you're looking at this scene of a crime, and you're kind of figuring out, okay, what happened here? And part of the problem is that you're having to put together facts and ideas from quite a while ago. And so we ask ourselves some basic questions for observation, especially just in the, in the text at this stage of our process, of kind of these contextual ideas of who is the author, who are the recipients, who are the main characters, what do we know about them from the passage, what are their characteristics, their needs, their circumstances. And then we ask some other questions. When and where did this take place? In other words, what do we know about the culture? Because what we want to find out is, is kind of what's going on here and, and how would they live their lives and kind of what would be important to them. The question of what is what is the genre because the literary context gives us clues. But if we were just to have these four key questions, we'd have a lot to um, be unsatisfied because the next question and that a lot of us go to is why. Why did this happen? Now, that probably is more of a question I think we ask when we see senseless acts of violence um, for perhaps like the Colorado shootings at the movie theater. We ask the question, why would someone do this? And we want to go back and part of the detective's job is to look at motive. They want to know, okay, what was going on in that person's head that they snapped and did this insane act? And so the same way with scripture, we want to start asking the question why. It's not enough just to say, okay, here's the data. We want to now understand what's important and to understand why, you know, we, um, we need to know that. All right. So those are two really important questions. How do we find out what is important and why is that important? Now, in this course, you're going to have a couple opportunities to demonstrate how much you know. And we call them celebrations of learning because no one likes the term final or midterm. And so we, we try to make it easier and more palatable. And so one of the things that you're going to be doing in this class is you're taking notes and you're writing things down. And yet you're going to notice that I tend to kind of start sharing stories and start going off the tangent. So you'll start writing down something and you think, this can't be on the test. You know, he's not going to ask me about that. And so let me give you some clues about what's important in this class. All right. So this will help you understand what you need to know. First of all, if anything is on the screen, anything that's written down, whether it's on the blackboard, the chalkboard, or, or the PowerPoint, that I'm using to kind of highlight and emphasize. I'm like, hey, hey, there's something here that I want you to know. And I'm going to try to make my PowerPoint slides when I write in the board, short, sweet, to the point, main ideas, big ideas. And so if I write anything down, you know you're going to want to write it down. Good clue. There's another thing I do. If I repeat something two or three times, if I say it two or three times, if I say it over and over and over again, if I say something more than once, that's something that you definitely want to, to know. Because even though I do have a tendency to go on rabbit trails, I try not to ramble. I try not to just, just to take up space. And, and you might know professors or had people that all they do is talk and talk and ramble on and it seems like, where are we going? Well, I'm going to try to kind of get this to the point. And so the same thing with scripture. Just like in this class, you'll know what's important, but it's either on the screen or I say it two or three times. Scripture has some clues to help us understand what was important, to understand the why, as kind of say this is something for us to take deeper into our, our mind. And so there's three things I want us to look for to help us understand that. Three things help us understand the purpose 
of why this was written, the motive for why this was written. God, so um, we're looking now. So we had those four key questions, help us understand the context. Well, now we're giving you three things to look for to help you understand the purpose or the importance of this passage. So when you're reading a passage of scripture, you can actually kind of look at that passage and say, okay, here's some things for me to understand at a deeper level of why this was you know, written for us. And the first thing, as we're looking at things that are emphasized, okay, so that's the first thing to look for. Well, th- to help us understand what is emphasized, that is one or one, is the large amount of space. I want you to understand that God never wastes his breath. So if he was going to go into great detail on a matter, it was important because it had to be handwritten. It wasn't able to be, you know, photocopied or, or just kind of like your word processor, quickly typing things out. But the reality is they had to, to really write out. So whatever is, you know, large amount of space lets us know this is something that's important to God. So take your Bibles and let's go to the book of Genesis real quick. All right. So as you're perusing the book of Genesis... There's quite a few things that might jump out at us at the very beginning. For example, if you kind of just are looking at the book of Genesis, there's two chapters on creation, right? And then we have nine chapters, you're just kind of quickly thumbing through it, of looking at the fall of mankind. And then we have, you know, the story of the flood. And then we have the Tower of Babel, nine chapters, and then in chapter 12, we have the introduction of Abram, who is, becomes Abraham. And then for the next 38 chapters, if you thumb through quickly, you'll see we have the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and all the brothers. 38 chapters that talk about this messed up family. I mean, if you want to read about a dysfunctional family, read those family stories. They have some dysfunction. 38 chapters. I have a grand total of 11 telling me about some of the most major events of world history. You know, I would love for God to go 38 chapters on creation. All right? That to me is like, that's significant, you know? I would love to know more than just God spoke and it was. I would love to know maybe kind of what it all really took place. But we're just told two chapters. And we'll talk more about those two chapters in just a little bit. But we're given just a quick synopsis of that. The fall of mankind, man, I would love to know what the Garden of Eden was like. I would love to know, really, how long between the creation of man to the fall, how many, how many days, years did it really take? Because i got to believe it wasn't like day three in the Garden, Adam and Eve sin. I mean, i got to believe they're in this amazing place, right? I would sure hope that they were just so fascinated by everything going on with each other that it took them a little while to notice, oh, there's a tree there. Oh, man, I want to know what I can know by that tree. So... You know, I would love more detail on that. Why does God give us so much more information about this family and go into such more space on this family than all these major events? What do you think? Why would God do that? What is God trying to show the emphasis is? Yeah, please. Okay, so perhaps part of the reason is God says these events happened, taken on faith. Here's kind of what, you know, some of the history of this family. Okay, what's another uh, idea here? Good, yeah. Yeah, I, I really agree with both your ideas, but Shay, I like that idea because uh, I really believe what God is saying here is people matter to me. My relationship with people is of so much more important. So as the Jews were looking back on their history, he wanted to emphasize, here's how you came to be my people, to have this significant relationship with me. And so if you just kind of are looking at a, kind of a scope of where is God spending his, his time, it's in people. And so we can kind of notice, that's just one example. You know, yes, uh, on Monday we talked about um, an epistle, and how much of, of an epistle really is, is just centered on theology. And, and so much of Paul's letters, you know, it's not like 50-50, all right, here's what we're supposed to believe, therefore this is what we're supposed to do. So much more is usually made about really kind of what we should be believing. You look at the book of Romans, how deep Paul goes into this, the discussion of our status in, of sin. And it's by grace we've been saved and all this, this reality that, you know, we can't earn it. And so there's this great discussion of theology. And then you have a handful of chapters after that saying, based on, therefore, that we now have this new relationship with God, here's how to live. You look at a gospel. 
And we're going to talk more about this in next week. But the reality is the way a gospel was, was written, you know, you have, you know, these sermons that take up a huge chunk. And then the last week of Christ's life has great detail, the Passion Week, to emphasize kind of what, you know, was going on there and the importance of that in our lives. So one of the things is you're just reading through a passage of Scripture, and if something just takes up a large amount of space, just know it's, it's there for emphasis. It's not just someone was rambling on. But those details really help us understand something to a greater level. The second way we know something is um, important or is being emphasized is the stated purpose of the author. All right. So um, here, like you do, I like for um, this side of the room, I want you to look up Proverbs chapter one, verses two through six. All right. And I like this side of the room to look up John 20, 20 uh, verses 30 through 31. And then we already looked at Luke 1, 1 through 4 as a class earlier as a, as a kind of a work si assignment. So I'm going to look up that one, all right? And I want you to think about what's the stated purpose in this passage, all right? What is the stated purpose of the author for why they wrote this, okay? So you all have your assigned passages. Proverbs chapter 1, 2 through 6. John chapter 20, 30 through 31. And I like some brave soul to summarize what the stated purpose is um, in that passage. All right. So look it over. All right. So someone from this side of the room, what is Proverbs chapter one, verse two through six? What is the stated purpose of this passage? To know wisdom. To know wisdom. Yeah. Where do you see that in this? Go ahead and just read that part for us. Where do you see it? Where it says it? Okay. And he goes on to list all these blessings that if you live this way, live according to these wise sayings that you're going to receive in your life. And so if you're reading a proverb, this isn't just like for like fun. It's to actually be lived out as this wisdom kind of shows you here's how to live. See, that's the difference between wisdom and you know, the idea of knowledge, you know, wisdom is the idea of application. You're, you're living in a way of taking knowledge and applying it to life. Great. Okay, John chapter 20. Someone want to just want to read for us that, those two verses? It's a little smaller section. All right, go ahead, Caroline. And to thee, Jesus, with many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. All right, so the reason we have the Gospel of John is that we might know how to have life. We might know what he has done. We, we can kind of trust in that, and we might believe. The same thing is, goes along with Luke. We looked earlier in the, in the semester, we looked at Luke chapter 1, verse 4. Basically, Luke says, you know, this is, I've written so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So in other words, this is but a trustworthy statement that you can kind of bank upon. So the, the stated purpose kind of helps us go deeper in understanding why we're reading this. So if you kind of know why this is being you know, written, you can kind of have better understanding in reading it. All right. Any questions so far? All right. The, the third way something is emphasized. So we're looking for three things to look for. Emphasize is the first thing. OK, but to help us understand what is emphasized or important, we have you know, um, large amount of space, stated purpose, and now we have the order of how something was discussed. Go back to Genesis with me, right? Let's look specifically at Genesis chapter 1. All right, so Genesis chapter 1, what is kind of being covered in this first chapter in the book of Genesis? That's right? History of creation, and by that, the six days, right? So you have all of creation being covered in chapter one. So what's chapter two? Okay, so you have the day six repeated in much more detail. Why? Why do we have this order of general to specific? Why do we have it kind of written in this order? What do you think? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, it, it kind of helps us understand the, the, if you were just to read chapter two on its own with having kind of the broad picture of God's creation whole, you might not be able to understand day six as it is. Okay. What's another idea? It, 
is all creation the same? Why? Why is not all creation the same? Do you believe man has a more significant existence than, than an animal or a plant or the ocean? Okay. What's one of the reasons we know this to be true? Image of God. Excellent. Yeah, we were made in his image. Now, the reality is um, that's mentioned in both chapter 1 and then kind of get a more essence in chapter 2. And so what you're seeing here is the elevation of the creation of man, that all things are created. So all things need to be cared for. But you have this the discussion of this general to the specific saying the creation of mankind shows this more significant relationship that man has with God. In other words, you know, it, it is this idea we are created in God's image, but you have this emphasis of saying, look, let's focus on the creation of man, not just all creation being equal, but, all, but the reality that all things need to be cared for in it because they're created by God, but the relation that God has with man is of much more significance. And you kind of see that, that more specific detailed and discussed here in Genesis chapter 2, looking at the importance of man's creation. Look at, at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Would someone like to read that for us? Go ahead, please. So you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Good. All right. So we see there's an order here. What's the order that is discussed in verse 8? Receive the Holy Spirit first. Okay, good. Receive the Holy Spirit first. Actually, what, that's what... Um, uh, they say back in verse 4, when it says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. So we see this process. So first we see the Spirit. Then you'll be my witnesses after you receive the power of the Spirit. And then what's, what's the order of kind of being a witness? Where's, where do we start? At home. Great. In Jerusalem. Okay, what's next? What's the next place we go? Yeah, the surrounding region, Judea, Samaria. And then where? Ends the earth. All right. Take your Bibles. Look at Gen uh, Acts chapter um, 2 through 7. Where are they at in Acts chapter 2 through 7? Just kind of thumb through quickly, look it over. Are they hanging out, you know, in Turkey? Are they hanging out in Rome yet? Where are they at? Yeah, they're in Jerusalem still. It's the church is working in Jerusalem. Peter and, and, uh, and uh, John are going to the temple and, and healing a guy. They're getting thrown in jail. It's all in Jerusalem. Then all of a sudden, you know, chapter 8 comes along and the persecution starts to happen. And all of a sudden, Philip gets taken to Samaria. And all of a sudden, in verses like 8 through 15, the focus is on, on Paul and Peter. And so you really see Peter back in, you know, in Jerusalem, but kind of getting taken to other parts of the region. He's kind of going to different places around the area, like, like Caesarea. And then all of a sudden, you start to see a focus change from just being um, Peter and, and to now being more on Paul. And starting like in verses 13 on, uh, sorry, chapter 13 on, you start to see Paul going farther and farther out. And then you have Paul going to the, you know, to Asia Minor, and then eventually talk about wanting to go on to Spain and to these other regions and, you know, past Rome. So you really kind of see that this order that was discussed in chapters, um, or chapter 1-8 is really kind of lived out in the entire book. So when you kind of just are looking at Scripture, how something is emphasized or, you know, kind of said, this is important, it's going to be through a large amount of space, through a stated purpose and through maybe the order being some, something general to specific or specific to general, you have to have this sequence later on you're looking for. All right? So that's the first thing to look for. It has three parts, I know, but the first thing to look for. The second thing to look for are things that are repeated. All right? Things that are repeated. Now, you, um, you might be asking, okay, what are some of those things? Well, um, terms, phrases, clauses, those are things that have been repeated. So, for example, take your Bibles and let's go to Psalm 136. All right. 
I listed some examples of these up there, but let's go to Psalm 136 and have some fun together, all right? So, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up, because sitting down puts us to sleep at this hour in the morning. All right, so everybody stand up. And I'm going to be the, uh, the speaker, and I want you to be the choir, all right? But instead of singing, you're going to very dramatically, with lots of passion, make a statement. There's this phrase, his love endures forever, that's repeated 26 times, okay? So I'm going to say the phrase, and then you're going to come back with his love endures forever, all right? So, ready, choir? Let's practice, all right. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. All right, I know it's early in the morning, but if you believe that, hopefully you'll have the energy next time. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. That was great. Remember, they're recording this forever now, so with, with gusto. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the, the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights? His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. His love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them. His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. His love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures to him who led his people through the desert. His love endures who struck down great kings. His love and killed mighty kings. His love endures Shine, king of the Amorites. His love endures and Og, king of Bashan. His love endures and gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures an inheritance to his servant Israel. To the one who remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies and who gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Amen. All right, have a seat. So imagine this. You're worshiping in the temple. You're singing this song and over and over again as they're talking about the story of the world to that point. The creation, your, your deliverance from, from Egypt, the, the establishment as a country. Throughout this entire history, you have this idea of God's stubborn love is there for you. Driving home. Man, think about it. In everything that God has done, from the creation of the world to establishing you, everything is done because of His love. And so you're going through difficult times and you see enemies threatening you on the hilltop and you're in the temple and you're scared. You're singing this song, God's love endures forever. God's love endures forever. Not a lot endures forever, all right? Very little is really lasts of any significant value. God's love endures forever. Over and over again, it's, it was said. I love the fact in Genesis 1, when God created something, he, he looked at something and said, it is good or it was good. In other words, when God created the world, he said that. Interesting enough, when God created man, he said it is good, right? So the idea of man is good, but then when he looked at man, he said it's not good that man's alone. So the idea of man was created in God's image, but he was intentionally created to be in community. Think about that. God intentionally made you and I to be with other people, to be finished by uh, potentially a spouse. Um, that actually is the idea of when you go back and you read what God says, I will make a helper for him. Um, that word in Hebrew, this is kind of interesting. This is a little side note for free. You don't have to write this down. The word helper doesn't mean servant, guys. So when you're looking at that, like, all right, good. I get some domestic help. No. The idea that God said we need a wife is to bring us to completion. That's what that word actually means, to bring to completion. So in other words, I'm only made perfect because of my wife. What she adds to me brings me to that completion that God originally intended and designed for me. You, you see, um, in, in kind of in Hebrews, let's cover right now, I'll jump down here. You have this idea of by faith. 
by faith. All these things were, were accomplished by faith. People kind of look forward to what they might have one day by faith. It's an incredible thing you see over and over and over again. You see characters that reappear throughout scripture. You know, the guys in the Old Testament are kind of brought up in the New Testament. You see um, characters kind of having this theme going in and out of the history of the church. So kind of take note of these different people that kind of get talked about over and over again. If you want to do an incredible devotional study, study the dimensions of Demas. Yes, one of Paul's compadres, Demas, in the Bible. Interestingly, in 2 Timothy, one of Paul's, Paul's last books, he talks about what Demas has done. Don't end up like Demas. I'll leave it at that. A little mystery for you to check out on your own devotional time. But you see Demas is mentioned in two or three different books. Check it out. See where he's at. You know, kind of what, what he's talked about there. We see incidents and circumstances that are repeated. All right. So in other words, you see some of these things that take place. For example, in the book of Judges, it's interesting. There's seven cycles that take place here. All right. So you see that basically what happens in the book of Judges is the people are at rest. You know, life's good. God's good. They're enjoying themselves. And then what do they do? They rebel. They're like, hey, God, uh, we can do it better. We want to do it our way. And so there's rebellion. Well, God says, right, if you're going to sin, I'm going to punish, all right? And so you basically have retribution. It's kind of a, a, an idea that bad things happen because of, of sin. Bad things happen to bad people, not all the time. But in this case, God would punish and give retribution. And the people would be kind of, you know, conquered by a people group. They'd come in and cause problems. And so they would cry out. They'd make a request, God help us. And God would rise up a judge, i.e. the book of Judges here, okay? He would rise up a judge who would lead the people to repentance. And so as the people, you know, kind of got right with God, God, through that judge, would kind of like kick these people out. And so all of a sudden, there was kind of return of control, all right? So in other words, through that judge, God would say, okay, you're going to rise up and you're going to overcome that people group that's oppressing you and then they would have rest again i know they're all ours i was a youth pastor i alliterate everything okay it's a sickness that all youth pastors have sorry but here's the cycle of judges so what's cool is if you're reading the book of judges you can kind of figure out where are you at in the cycle and know what should be coming next and it just kind of gives you greater understanding of the passage all right there are patterns that are repeated throughout scripture a lot of times you see these parallels between the life of Christ and, and Old Testament characters. You see parallels in, in the Psalms. So you look for these patterns that kind of, you know, these repetitions that just kind of turn into these patterns. One last one is anytime the Old Testament is reused in the New Testament, whether it's a prophecy that was quoted or it was kind of God's demonstrating um, his new work, kind of the new covenant compared to the old covenant. Anytime you see the Old Testament quote in the New Testament, it's like God taking a, a spiritual neon highlighter and you're like, pay attention to this. It's huge. Anytime you see that taking place, it is big. All right. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.